Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Kaplan. Uh, I'm one of the founders of We SF. I'm a columnist for the San Francisco Examiner um, and the host of the We Are San Francisco podcast. And I would like to welcome you to the city's most inclusive town hall event. We have people here who are progressives. We have people here who are moderates. We have liberals. We have conservatives. We have Democrats. We even have some Republicans. <laughs> okay. And we have people here who are native San Franciscans who have worked in the city and tried to make the city better for decades. We have people here who are transplants, who are new, who are here because they love it and they want to get involved now. So we try to represent all of these kind of viewpoints. We've made a point of having a fair take, all sides point of view in everything we're doing today. We're probably not gonna get to every point of view, but we're gonna try to do our best to recognize everyone, and we want to be inclusive, and our goal from whether that's we or the broader coalition of organizations that are here today is to create civic engagement, get you involved in making your city. To paraphrase JFK, ask not what the city can do for you, ask what you can do for your city. So, okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so, um, a few things. Um, um, many of us here are part of WE. Um, I'll explain what that is, but certainly without our partners at Commonwealth Club, Wor at World Affairs, um, generous sponsorship from the Guggenheim Family Foundation, and ID8SF, for those of you who we are right, right on the edge of East Cut, um, it's a group that's doing a lot in sort of the high dense areas of San Francisco, so thank you to all of our partners. And WE is a community-led movement to solve some of San Francisco's most challenging problems with collective will and coordinated action. One of the reasons we wanted to do the city's most inclusive town hall is we think there's more that connects us together than divides us. We're in an incredibly polarizing time. We're facing really difficult problems. But if we can join together and work together and come together, there's no limit on what we can accomplish. So our goal tonight is to empower all of you to get involved in improving the community we love. And we're going to start by talking about the March 5th election, which is happening now, which is a great way um, to get started. So a few people I just want to, you can find later at the, at the reception we'll have that are critical to this happening today. Uh, Seema Shri, where are you, Seema? I think you're around or maybe you're getting, getting ready over there. We call her the connector. She's also on the trans Bay Citizen Advisory Committee. Um, was, you'll hear from her later today. Chris Chang, co-founder of IDSF. He has one of the, Chris, are you there? He's, oh, he's, he's there upstairs. Okay, he uh, has the, the greatest nickname among us, which is the voice of reason. He's incredibly reasonable. You'll hear, uh, you'll hear from Chris later. Max Lemurl, who's in the back, former LA elected official. We're lucky to have him here. He's the maximizer. Um, if you need your data set maximized, if you need your slide deck like this one enhanced, you talk to Max. Um, Brandon, oh, and Brandon, where are you? You are, Brandon is right there. He's the influencer. You need to check out his social media feed. And Candace Curtin, who um, heads up a lot of our events. I know Candace is here. You'll want to talk to her. She's the, she's the planner. So here's what March 5th is at a glance. We have a presidential primary. We have federal and state elections and ballot propositions. And then notably for our city, there are seven city, um, city uh, measures, uh, propositions A through G. There are two superior court judge seats that are um, up for uh, election. And then there are the party county central committee seats. And we'll talk about why those are important a little bit later, but 24 on the Democrat side, 25, I believe, on the Republican side. And this is all happening um, very soon right now. We're going to discuss all of that today through a series of three panels. One of the things we want to do was explore all of these issues, explore the propositions, but we didn't want to maybe make you sit through one by one and have a four hour town hall. So instead what we've done is we'll have one panel on public safety. We'll talk about proposition, the two um, basically public safety related um, um, props on the ballot. Prop B for police staffing and future uh, taxes related to that and Prop E related to police powers. We'll do a second panel on housing and supportive services. In that panel we'll group Prop A which is the affordable housing bond, Prop C which is um, changing some of the fees and taxes related to residential conversions and Prop F which is um, maybe one of our uh, most debatable ones on drug screening for city services, screening and treatment. And then finally, we'll wrap up a third panel with a panel on government accountability that kind of combines 
um, Proposition D, which is on new ethics rules, and also Propos Proposition G, which is actually on math or algebra instruction, but some of its reasons we'll he hear from uh, the sponsor, creator of this today, is to ensure more government accountability, which we'll discuss as well. So does that sound good? Does that sound like a plan? Okay, very good. So here's the schedule if you're just keeping track. Um, roughly about 30 minutes per panel. Um, we'll have an opportunity to introduce the Superior Court judges, both incumbents and challengers. I believe we'll have all four who are on the ballot here today. We'll, have, um, we'll, uh, we'll talk about some of the people who are running for their party central committees. We have a lot of folks, probably dozens here today, who will be joining us, uh, especially later. And we're gonna have at the end a meet the candidates reception out there, which is a great chance all in one place to talk to a lot of the people running, the people sponsoring ballot measures and other elected officials. So these are the folks that are in the room today. And the point I wanna mention before we officially begin is just the one special phrase for today. Because there's a lot of points of view. In fact, you may be sitting next to a person who passionately believes in the exact opposite that you do. Okay, that's a feature of our town hall. So the phrase I want to introduce you to, the phrase of the day, if you get in a conversation, if emotions are getting heated, if you're like, oh, I, I'm, this person's really making me mad, there's one phrase you're going to use, and that is this. Let's agree to disagree. Say it once with me, just so you have it there. Say, let's agree to disagree. Let's agree to disagree. To disagree. And if you are feeling inspired and you want to add one little bit to this, you can always say, let's agree to disagree. Want to go have a beer. <laughs> you can add that as well. Okay, so that's the spirit of today. We want to hear a lot of voices. We want to encourage dialogue and um, we want to be respectful of each other. Okay, so a few things that we had to do to make sure that we could get through this program in 90 minutes. First thing in regard to questions. There is a phone number right here, 415-301-6700. If you text that number, both Max, Seema, and myself will get your questions here, and we're gonna be monitoring this. We don't have time to go to everyone in the crowd and keep on schedule, so if you text that number now, if you wanna prepare, you're, there'll be a short form to register with us, and then I'll get your questions here, and we'll try to work them in. We'll try to get as many questions as we can, and we'll try to get you know, all sides of issues if we can. That's number one. Number two, we are launching today what we're calling the People's Census. What the People's Census is, is we are going to survey 15,000 San Franciscans on what they really think, their real experience, whether they, you know, what's captured in the demographics, what isn't captured. And besides voting by March 5th, um, if you want something to do in five minutes that can make a difference for your city, it's the People's Census, and hopefully we'll come back in about a month or two, we'll have another town hall, and we'll share the results of that. So ask questions, text that number, complete the People's Census, you can shoot that QR code, and we'd love to get your thoughts. So let's start out with now public safety, um, the first panel, and we're going to invite our panelists here in just a second. I think, uh, yeah, I, I see some panelists there. And before we begin, I want to give you a quick summary um, try and be an objective summary of these two propositions, police staffing and future taxes, which is Proposition B, and Proposition E, which is related to police powers. I know this is small on the screen, but just to give you a sense of this, um, I'm going to very quickly read this to you, Proposition B. Shall the city amend the charter to set minimum police officer staffing levels, require the city to budget enough money to pay the number of police officers employed in the previous year, allow the police department to introduce amendments to its budget, and set aside funds to pay for police recruitment, all for at least five years, but all if and only if the voters later adopt a new tax or amend an existing tax to fund these requirements. And just to summarize this a little bit for you, uh, quickly, supporters say of Prop B that police staffing needs a clear funding source, that police staffing shouldn't reduce funding for other essential service workers, and that set-asides in the city budget can be problematic. On the other hand, opponents say, this measure would actually slow down police full staffing, that requiring new funding is like adding a cop tax for basic city services, and this measure confuses, confuses voters who may not understand it. Okay, so that's Proposition B. Second proposition we'll discuss in the public safety um, portion of the panel is police powers, and I'll read this quickly to you. There's, there's, there's a lot here, so bear with me. We'll do it, we'll do it quickly. Shall the city allow the police department to hold community meetings before the police commission who can change policing policies, reduce record keeping and reporting requirements for police officers, 
set new policies for police, police officers to report use of force incidents and to engage in vehicle pursuits. Authorize the police department to use drones and install public surveillance cameras without further approval. And authorize the police department to use new surveillance technology unless the Board of Supervisors disapproves. And specifically, to summarize Proposition E, supporters say the measure would enhance police tools and technology, it would reduce time spent on admin work and get police back on the street, and it would improve efficiency during our current staffing shortage. On the flip side, opponents say this would reduce oversight and accountability of our police force. The police commission is already working on how to apprehend criminals without safety risks, and it would set back progress on use of force safeguards. So with that being said, join me in welcoming our public safety panel. First, Supervisor Matt Dorsey, and also Julie Tron from the Bar Association of San Francisco. Please come up and have a seat. Yeah, right there. And, and grab a microphone there. Okay. Yeah, please have a seat right there. Yes. And we'll start, and, and we'll kind of have an open discussion, you know, both between Prop, you know, B and Prop E. Um, one of the things that I think would be useful to start with, because I think it's just confusing, is quickly, Supervisor Dorsey, you originally sponsored Proposition B. You are now not the sponsor of Proposition B. You're the opponent to it. Just maybe, and just quickly, so people are they're trying to tr track all of this. Uh, give us the, the quick story of that, just so people can follow through. I struggle with brevity, so I don't know how quick I'll be. <laughs> Um, for most of last year, I worked um, with the city controller, the city attorney, the mayor's budget office, and the police department to solve what I believe is the number one public safety challenge that San Francisco is facing, and that is a level of police understaffing that we have never seen before in our history. Right now, one third of the police department San Francisco is supposed to have isn't there, and what is more troubling to me is that there are 300 or so police officers who are eligible for full retirement right now and this is all happening at a time when we're having a difficult time competing with other jurisdictions to get re new recruits so I felt very very um, strongly as, a, as somebody who has been a supervisor now for about a year and a half how m that most of the problems that I respond to from constituents involve some explanation that we don't have enough police officers to do that and there are whole categories of lawlessness and crime that we're not enforcing. Um, and it's really undermining our city. It's, it's robbing neighborhoods of the safety, safe enjoyment of their communities. And it's also, I think, part of the reason that we're struggling to have hotel conventions and tourists and commuters coming back. So I worked on a charter amendment and at the last moment, there was a political stunt that I was hoping Supervisor Safai would be here to talk about. Um, where there was gonna be, we're gonna adopt the words into the charter, but we're gonna do something that I have never seen in, in 30 years of San Francisco politics. We're gonna have a requirement that there has to be a, a tax hike, a cop tax, if we want this to take effect. Now, I think this is legally problematic for reasons we can get into, um, but I think this is something that isn't gonna go over well with voters. I think it is actually potentially disastrous because if it in, uh, ends up in litigation, for reasons that I can explain later at some point in this. Um, it'll delay progress on police staffing for years, and we don't have time to wait. So that's sort of the background. Okay, that's background Proposition B. Now, Julie, I want to talk to you about Proposition E. Um, you are with the Bar Association of San Francisco. The Bar Association of San Francisco has taken a position against Proposition E, and we've spoken before that this is actually somewhat rare because rep the Bar Association represents a lot of different attorneys with lots of different points of view. How did that opposition come to pass, and, and, and why was that for Proposition E? So if I could give a little bit of context, the Bar Association is about 7,000 members. We're the largest legal organization in Northern California. There's only one other Bar Association larger than ours in the state, and that's Los Angeles. Um, we're a very active Bar Association. We're very dedicated to access to justice, and you know we always do debates when judges are running and, and those kinds of things. We have a host of pro uh, programs that serve members of the public. In 2015, we formed a criminal justice task force. It was in the wake of Ferguson, Missouri, when Michael Brown was killed, and you might remember, Ferguson was on fire. And we together, my, my executive director, Yolanda Jackson, who had hoped to be here tonight, but she forgot to mention it was her wedding it's anniversary. It's her wedding anniversary, so. And okay, she yes. told her husband, and he says, oh, I don't think you're doing that, so okay. I'm the ringer. <laughs> and um, 
In 2015, we formed this task force, and it was a group of volunteer lawyers. We included judges, district attorney, public defender, the police department, the sheriff's department, the ACLU, civil rights attorneys, pretrial services for both San Francisco courts as well as federal courts, and we have been meeting every single month since. We all get along. We all listen to each other, and we are great problem solvers as a group. And I just wish everybody's boss could do the same thing when they got into the room. But that doesn't always happen. So this task force has taken on a number of different tasks over the years. We've sat on every single working group that the police department has formed. I personally negotiated the use of force policy with the POA in 2016. If somebody had told me I would be doing that, I would have said, I don't think so. Um, and that use of force policy that was, was, was decided in 2016 then became the basis for the rest of the state to follow suit. So we have worked very closely with the Department of Justice, with the police department, and with experts. We are constantly researching, and this is the role that we feel lawyers can play. When there is a complicated issue, um, we dig in with legal research, and that's what we did with Prop E. We took Prop E, we formed a research group, and we wrote a 16-page single-space position paper, which we submitted to the Board of Supervisors and to the Rules Committee when Supervisor Dorsey was there. Um, we knew the Rules Committee wasn't going to do anything, but we wanted to go on record as to why we were taking a position. If you look in your voter pamphlet, you will see that the Bar Association has taken out a paid for no um, position. I think that is the second time that the Bar Association has done that in the history of this Bar Association. So, and you can imagine, so what it happens is the task force takes a position, they do the research, they come back to the task force and they go to the board. Our board is a large board comprised of, I'd say, primarily civil corporate lawyers. We took a position on surveillance cameras, super robust conversation you know, back and forth, but wait, I represent the businesses on Union Square. I think we need to have cameras. I think we need to have them there all the time. But what about the Constitution? Here's where I come down personally, and this is a conversation I've had with the chief a couple of times. I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I live in San Francisco. I have an adult daughter who's been the victim of a crime. I've been a victim of a crime. I've gotten cases thrown out because basically the police department has messed up. If something happened to my daughter, I would want to make sure that we did not violate a statute, an ordinance, a constitution, because I would want that conviction to stick. And so that's my personal belief, and that's why we weigh in, and we are always looking for, but you could do it this way, Chief, legally. If you take a shortcut, this case could get thrown out. So that's the reason we took this position. We believe very strongly in public safety and in good governance. And you know, we quoted the chief from 2018 when there was another ballot measure that was placed on the ballot by the POA about tasers. And the chief weighed in very strongly then. And he didn't disagree with that position when he was asked questions before the, the rules committee that this is police policy does not belong on a ballot. It's complicated. I can tell you it's very complicated. And I always look to kind of two voices in the room, the subject matter experts from the police department, because these guys know what they're doing, and the people that understand what all the laws are in the Ninth Circuit, in the state of California, and what all the bills are and the rules and how we're going to violate them and how we can stay within them. Uh, uh, so. And, and, and Supervisor Dorsey, I mean, to, to unpack a, a couple points that, that Julie said. One was that, you know, the sort of the risk of, you know, privacy concerns, others. With it. But, but two, also she brought up, I mean, when you do something like a ballot measure, when you're amending the charter, this is like the Constitution, right? This is like a thing that is not really meant to be like fine-tuned later. What is your response, because I know you're a supporter of Proposition E, to this idea of like, we shouldn't even be doing this in a proposition. There should be some other way that this should be implemented. I would say even even with the proposition that I'm most emotionally invested in and is, is Proposition B, I'm not a fan of ballot box budgeting. It was only because we have a Board of Supervisors that has shown that it's not interested. At least right now, a majority of the Board of Supervisors is not interested in solving police staffing. And if you want any evidence, 
read Proposition B and what it does and what it, how it was changed to make to delay progress on police staffing. Six of my colleagues voted to do that. So if you want to know why we have to go to voters is because I trust voters to fix something that I don't think City Hall has the, the political will to solve. And I represent a district that is this district, that is the convention center and hotels and the warriors and the giants. This is a lot of the engine of our economy. And I think I have authority as a District 6 downtown supervisor to say, we can't afford to not fix our police staffing crisis. I'm not, I don't like budget set-asides, but I think sometimes it's necessary to do that when, when, there's, when the legislative body isn't uh, doing what people want it to do. This goes back to Governor Hiram Johnson from the, the, the progressive era a century ago um, when voters have the right to step into the shoes of the legislature to, to enact things. Now, hopefully when that happens, there's thoughtfulness to enabling the Board of Supervisors to fix things, sunsetting provisions, as, as my charter amendment would have done, um, and, and, and being modest and not over, overreaching. So I know that I'm going to you know, focus mostly on B. But I, I, I get that there's concerns about taking complicated things to voters, but there's also a question that that's legitimate, that sometimes voters are in a different place than where their elected leaders are, and if you want progress, I trust you, voters, more than some of my colleagues. Right now, more than a majority of my colleagues, unfortunately. Well, and, and, and for both of you, what would actually, you know, the, the panels on public safety, broader than just Proposition Beery, what would make the biggest difference. I mean, I think some of these, particularly Proposition E, has been in this sort of dialogue of, is it a political effort? We have a mayor who's running for re-election, and there's certain reasons why having a ballot measure would be advantageous for those efforts. Um, what is your opinion of just, you know, what would make the biggest difference if, if, if you were, you know, mayor for a day, you could enact anything. What would actually, because I know a lot of people here are concerned about public safety, what would actually make a difference in having an immediate impact? I'd be interested in both of your opinions. Well, I think the biggest problem with Proposition E, if it were to pass, we're just going to be looking at endless lawsuits. I, kn I know, you know, organizations that are already ready uh, to file. Um, I think we would, we don't litigate, we don't do it that way. We would probably file amicus briefs along the line of the positions that, that we've taken in our 16, I brought 25 copies, clearly not enough for all of you, um, but we, we certainly can make it available to you because I think it's a thoughtful piece, and as I said, we did take a position in the voter pamphlet. Public safety is, you know, it's complicated. I, I, you know, I worry that the criminal justice system has always been sort of the dumping ground for failed social programs. I've sat with so many police officers who have told me I drive around all night long with a crazy guy in the back seat and I got no place to take him. Why is that my job? Why is that my job? You know, and I, and I think that we need to bring, and one of the things I love about our task force is that we bring smart people to the table who really can come up with some solutions. It is complicated, but I, I just, I think I come back to the position of this is, this is complicated and what we're doing is actually working. When I first started working with this police department, we had very few general orders that were up to date. Um, there was a commander who then became the chief of Hayward, Tony Chaplin, I don't know if you ever met him, and I said, what's with all these old, you know, DGOs? He said, Julie, writing a DGO in this city is like, you might as well ask Moses to come down from the mountain. You know, it's so complicated and it's so hard, and that's why we have all of these departmental bulletins. And that was one of the biggest criticisms by the Department of Justice. You guys are not up to date. And that's what the commission and the police department and all these working groups have done. We're doing all of these things that, you know, especially about the community meetings. These are all community people. There's business people, business owners, people like me, people who've been victims of crimes, um, you know, people who've been critical of the police. Um, that They're all part of the working groups and having all those voices in the room, I wish that you could all have attended some of those meetings. They were brilliant and wonderful. And they were solutions that were worked out together. So I think some politicians have, have taken aim at some of this, thinking it's not working. It actually sort of is working. You know, it was interesting to me that one of, 
One of the issues is drones. We're, we advocate for drones. We, you know, you'll see in our letter that the police chasing is probably the most worrisome thing. I think the two most worrisome things are police chasing. Cops don't want to do this. Um, and use of force, reducing use of force reporting. Most officers really want to document why they used force, because that's how they're going to defend themselves. And the way that the police chase uh, portion of E is written, an officer, currently, an officer is prohibited from, um, from engaging in a police pursuit because the city is just so dense. Um, and that general order, which was written in 2013, was, was written by Greg Sir and um, Susie Loftus. And it's a, I've talked to Greg, there's nothing wrong with that. The chief was asked on January 10th at a commission hearing, do you think that our current general order on, on police pursuits is consistent with best practices? And his answer was yes. And so did the officers who were presenting that night. So the Department of Justice, if I could just read one thing, Department of Justice um, in 2023 issued a full report on police reports and had this to say, Pursuit should take place only when two very specific standards are met. A violent crime has been committed and the suspect poses an immediate threat to commit another violent crime. Aptly, the report noted, you can get a suspect another day, but you can't get back a life. And that's a problem with the police pursuits and it leaves way too much discretion to the individual officers. If I've learned anything, cops like to know exactly what they're permitted to do and what they're not permitted to do because they're terrified of being disciplined for exercising discretion when it wasn't spelled out for them. And I respect that. Well, and, and Supervisor Dorsey, what is, so it was you know, sort of a previous era when a lot of these rules were written. There was, a, there was fatalities, injuries, and others from people that were caught in the midst of these police chases. That's why some of these rules were in place. But now there's a lot of discussion about police being kind of prevented from just tracking, you know, and, 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 and doing the things that we would hope they did, would do in following up with the criminal. So what changed between now and then is, you know, is, is this a pendulum that kind of swings between that or do you, and, and where do you think we are now? It's somewhat of a pendulum. I, I would say, um, I mean, a little bit about me is, I think people know that before I became a member of the Board of Supervisors, I spent two years in the police department working for the chief of police. Uh, you may not know that most of my career was actually in the San Francisco City Attorney's Office with Dennis Herrera. I was on the executive staff for 14 years. So I was around for a lot of the problems that were when there was excessive force, use of uh, officer-involved shootings, um, many things that played out that created the environment where it was necessary for Mayor Lee and Chief Sir to ask the U.S. Department of Justice to come in and do a top-to-bottom assessment of the SFPD, what, what needs to change here. Um, when I was interviewing to come back to the city, I did some private sector work for a couple of years, and I had an opportunity to work at a couple of different departments, and there was a position that opened up working with Bill Scott. And I was such an admirer of the work that he has been doing on police reform kind of quietly. I don't think people fully appreciate that San Francisco's police department has been doing the work of 21st century police reform in ways that no other city in the country has, largely because Donald Trump pulled the plug on it. The only city in the nation that went back to their state attorney general and reinvented a program of doing a collaborative, what's called a collaborative reform initiative to do these reforms was San Francisco. Now, when in terms of what's changed or what might need to change and why I'm, I am supporting that, I think this uh, Prop E is measured. The one thing that I am concerned about as a local policymaker is when San Francisco is making policies that restrict our police department in ways that neighboring jurisdictions are not restricted. Where I think that's particularly acute is in the surveillance technology realm. Um, there is a lot of organized retail or organized criminal enterprises, retail theft, drug dealing, things that operate across city and county borders. And sometimes we can enact policies that make San Francisco into a softer target. Um, I think that sometimes is what plays out from what I hear from people in law enforcement. But I will also say to something that, that um, Julie mentioned about the possibility of lawsuits, that's actually a concern that I have with Prop B as well. Um, if, if Proposition B passes, it, cr it does something that is very strange in the law, where it's an end run around constitutional restrictions on special taxation. 
In California's constitution, if you want a special tax for a specific purpose, it needs a two-thirds vote. So this is actually doing something that's kind of an end run around that, creating a debit side obligation where we have to, the first tax hike that comes in has to be for a specific purpose. And my worry is that that's going to be something that the Howard Jarvis people are going to sue us over. Why? Because they sue us over anything to do with taxes. And I know for Prop C, it took three years to get through that litigation. For Regional Measure 3, it took five years to get through that litigation. And this isn't something where even if everything goes right with this cop tax scheme, that we're, that we could have to face a lawsuit and then where all those dollars all that funding is locked up for five years while we're waiting and we can't afford to do that this is sort of a last minute political stunt i wish that i think the intellectually honest thing to do if one was opposed to the police staffing measure that i had been working on for much of last year is just vote it down i think this sort of political gamesmanship that played out with this need for a tax um, was cynical and it's deeply misleading i'm very troubled by Prop B and how it is representing itself as a public safety measure to voters without even mentioning that it's a tax hike. Well, I, I want to get to some, some questions from the audience. And as a reminder, you can text questions there, and, and I'm monitoring this. And, and one is from Aaron Roach. And Aaron is specifically asking about the link between B and E. What she's saying is that she says, well, if we don't have enough money to hire police, if we're not fully staffed, shouldn't we use technology more to try to fill in the gap. An example of that is actually in India where they have a very low sort of sort of police staffing to, um, to overall population level. They use a lot of facial recognition technology because they don't believe they have enough police to do it, so they use technology. So is there a balance between staffing and technology? It's a question from, from Aaron Roach. I would say you have to be very careful of the kind of technology that you use, which is why we have in this city we have uh, 19B, Administrative Code 19B, and COIT, which is the I was, Committee on Information Technology. Um, and you know, if, it, if, if, it's, if it's proposed properly, it, it happens pretty fast. Um, you know, I recently saw that, I mean, we already have drones. The police department has applied for the use of drones. I just got a surveillance impact report. Um, you also have to comply with AB 481, which is a state statute, which was actually drafted by David Chu. So um, there are laws that we have to comply with. So just saying, oh, let's just do it. And we also are looking, are, we're actually doing some research that the chief actually asked us to look into. We're looking not only at the legal aspects of a lot of this technology, but also at the efficacy. So, for example, there's a 36% error rate on license plate reader um, technology. The, the, and one of the reasons that I think San Francisco um, has been opposed to facial recognition is because the error rate, particularly with people of color, can be as much as 100%. I mean, it's outrageous, the, the error rate on, on this technology. So you don't want to be in that situation. But we do want to be careful and thoughtful about it. And I noticed that in a recent um, SI our report, surveillance impact report, which is part of what the police department has to do or any department has to do when, when they're using technology, they're already using drones for to look at sideshows, major critical incidents, high-risk search warrant service, apprehension of armed and dangerous or violent suspects, hostage or crisis negotiation teams, um, apprehension of suspects who have fled on foot, auto burglary, uh, robbery abatement operations. I, I, I talked to um, a, a friend high up in the police department who's sort of my go-to guy, somebody I really love and trust who has common sense, and I asked about the police pursuit, and he said, hell no, we're not, I don't want to do that, but he said, we'll take some tools. Give us some drones, give us some you know, GPS launchers that you can attach onto the car as it's fleeing, or give us some strips which the, the police commission has already authorized. These are spike strips. You know where the suspect is going. You get ahead of them and put down the spike strips. All their tires deflate, and there you go. Um, so I think that you know, bringing the right people to the table, and I do think it's complicated. It is serious sausage making. I sat in that room for 10 hours for two days straight negotiating the use of force, looking, thinking about every conceivable law and case that we might be violating if we wrote it this way as opposed to that way. Well, and, and, and we only have a couple minutes left in this panel. There's, there's a bunch of questions that people have submitted that are just people are very concerned about public safety. 
very concerned about crime. And there's variations of questions that, that are all saying like, are we in a crisis now? Are we in a public safety crisis where normal rules that we might do, we just have to take action? What do you think, Supervisor Dorsey, of this notion of like where we are now as a city that you know, business as usual has to be different? What I think we really have to focus on, I don't think there is a substitute for full, a fully staffed police department. Um, and one of the things that we had in San Francisco for 25 years was a minimum staffing level of 1,971 police officers. This was adopted by voters in the charter back in 1994, and it was there. We struggled to hit that number, but in hindsight now we know it kept the city honest enough that nobody sued the city over the violation of it. In other words, it, we were close enough in police staffing that it was probably, it, now in hindsight we know, a good thing to have. In November of 2020, voters changed the process for deciding how many police officers we need. Um, there was an independent workload-based analysis, a process that uh, former supervisor Norman, and Norman president Yee, Norman Yee right, yeah. led, um, which I think a, a city like San Francisco really needed to get a benchmark based on calls for service, population, tourism, all the things, things that we need to assess to figure out how many police officers we need. Right now, it's roughly 2,100 full-duty police officers. What we have instead is about 1,460 about a third of the police department's not there. And, and I think you... And that's unprecedented. When you've talked about in the past that because of sort of the the rise of police officers, kind of from the Clinton era, yeah. that are now retiring, we're also facing an issue of, what, about 300 police officers that are kind of at or near retirement age. Correct? I think for, for what's, what is frustrating to me is that we have, as a city and... Um, it's not just unique to San Francisco, but there are public safety challenges that we're facing that were unforeseeable. We didn't know COVID was coming. We didn't know that there was going to be a drug, fentanyl, that is as deadly and addictive as it is. We have known for 30 years that this police staffing crisis was coming, that this day was coming, because when Bill Clinton ran for president in 1992, he committed, I'm going to put 100,000 cops on the street. Do you, does everybody remember when he you're, did you're that? Doing the Bill Clinton, you're doing up, the Bill I, uh, yeah, Clinton uh, hand gesture. Trying to do there, my, my Bill Clinton. Okay, yeah. Um, it ended up being about closer to 125,000, but there's a whole generation of a generational cohort of police officer reaching retirement age, and we haven't acted enough to replace that. That's why I feel really strongly we have to have a plan. That's why I was hoping that uh, the thing that I would be talking to you about was not a, a cynical cop tax scheme political trick that I'm trying to defeat. I was hoping that I would be here asking for a vote for let's let's fix this over a period of five years. Sadly, we're not. I'm going to do what I can to work with some people, and hopefully we'll go out get some signatures, and I'll be back here in November with a plan that will actually work. But we need to fix police staffing because, again, a city that is as invested in being safe and clean and welcoming to retail shoppers, commuters, residents, conventions, and tourists cannot afford to not solve the police staffing crisis that we've got. Okay, well, I, I, if I could just yeah, say, maybe the, maybe the, 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 the final, final word, oh, yeah. Okay, Bar Association hasn't taken a position on B, but I, I promise you that the Bar Association supports um, a fully staffed police department, one that is nimble, and um, one that can respond to all of our needs. Um, one thing we could do is we could speed up the process on how one becomes a police officer. There was a young woman in our office who applied, and she gave up. It was too complicated. I think that's true of a lot of our civil service positions, and I would hope that we could we could streamline some of that. I think that's part of well, the problem. And, and, and even I basic things agree. where sometimes, you know, it's a requirement that you have to have a driver's license and drive, right. but maybe you grew up in the city and don't have one. Maybe there's a way that we can deal with some of those issues too. So we are out of time. I don't know if you guys can hang out, hang out at, at 8.30 to 9.30, take more questions at our reception, but um, could we give our panel a big round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> our DJ Tara, a round of applause. Um, we're going to jump in, and, and one of our goals was to, you know, group this into, into, into three different panels. This one is a far-ranging one. We have people with, with different points of view on this because we're going to talk about propositions A, C, and F. Um, I'm going to do this quickly to get us back on time. Um, proposition A, affordable housing bond, and specifically, um, uh, I'll, there's a lot of technical stuff here. I'll do this fast. San Francisco affordable housing bonds. To construct, develop, acquire, and or rehabilitate housing, including workforce housing and senior housing, that will be affordable to households ranging from extremely low income to moderate income households. 
Shall the city and county of San Francisco issue $300 million in general obligation bonds subject to independent citizen oversight and regular audits with a duration of up to 30 years from the time of issuance, an estimated average tax rate of $0.0057 per $100 of assessed property value and projected annual revenues of $25 million. And just to kind of break this down quickly, um, supporters say that this is a critical solution to the housing affordability crisis. It implements oversights and audits to ensure funds are used as promised, and it doesn't come from property taxes, so it won't impact housing costs, rental rates. Opponents say that state mandates are not reasonable. Some of this is, is meant to try to reach state mandates, and the city does not have to meet them. That taxpayers have funded $1.5 billion in affordable housing. Will another $300 million matter? And affording, affordable housing bonds add costs to homeowners. So that's Proposition A. Proposition C on residential conversions. Specifically, shall the city exempt from the real estate transfer tax the first time a property is transferred after being converted from a commercial to residential use, have authority to amend the transfer tax without voter approval, but not to increase it, and increase the annual limit on office space available for development by including office space that has been converted to a different use or demolished. To summarize, supporters say that C will remove barriers, which are a transfer tax, to incentivize developers to convert offices into homes, takes vacant space and turns it into needed housing, and is an opportunity to attract investment and excitement in downtown. Opponents say it's a corporate tax break for wealthy developers and property owners, that it gives elected, that give elected leaders the choice in the transfer tax rather than taking this to voters, and that the transfer tax is actually a source of revenue and affordable housing is already exempt. Essentially, it's not needed. And finally, um, maybe the, the most debatable one here, there's a lot of discussion about this, is Proposition F, drug seat screening for city services. Shall the city require single adults age 65 and under with no dependent children who receive city public assistance benefits and whom the city reasonably suspects are dependent on illegal drugs to participate in screening, evaluation, and treatment for drug dependency for those adults to be eligible to, for most of those benefits? Um, supporters say uh, that we have, it's a strong tool to help address the deadly, deadly drug crisis that offers of treatment without incentive or, or compulsion are not enough and that it balances compassion and accountability to get more people in treatment. Opponents say it will actually increase the number of people experiencing homelessness because some people will opt out. It takes away vital support services for the vulnerable and we should prioritize getting more people into housing and services, not conditional support or creating blockers to doing that. So with that being said, ACNF, um, we have an esteemed panel, Supervisor Myrna Melgar, Supervisor Raphael Mandelman, and Laura Thomas from the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Give them a round of applause. And um, Supervisor Melgar, I'd like to start with you. Um, there is a lot of concern, certainly, about the fentanyl crisis, the drug crisis, and this notion of do we just need to do whatever we can to get people into treatment? And maybe making a requirement to just be in treatment is a way to advance that. What is your opinion um, of that um, as just new measures needed to just do something about the drug crisis, which it seems like we've been unsuccessful at solving? Sure. I mean, I uh, am all for innovation. And I think that sometimes uh, we, in a crisis, need to do things differently. Um, however, we have one of the most progressive, forward-looking, you know, uh, best capacity public health departments in the country. Um, and, you know, I do believe in evidence. <laughs> I think that, you know, if you're going to do something, there has to be a framework or some kind of uh, science behind it that proves that it works. And so uh, I think And, and your opinion is that it, it, there's not a science that proves that, that compelling people into to, to, to treatment would work? Or Correct. <laughs> Actually, quite the opposite. So when people are ready, they, they do it. Um, I do think that there are instances where people just cannot care for themselves. You know, there is, uh, it's not just folks who use drugs. There's all kinds of ways in which human beings lose the capacity to make executive decisions. And in that way, you know, it is appropriate for the state to step in. But I do think that if we're going to do something that goes so far as to deprive somebody of their ability to make choices for themselves, we should have evidence. We should have a scientific basis for how we do it and to prove that the approach is working. And when we're doing something that's not working, we should be able to say, hey, let's put a stop to this and do something else because what we're doing is not working. Supervisor Mandelman, um, one question for you and, and, and also 
part of this question comes from Suzanne Ford. Um, you might have a, 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 a different view on this. Um, you know, how would we, how would this work, Proposition F, if the infrastructure for treatment isn't expanded? One of the discussion points is, how would it work if we just don't have enough, you know, beds? If everyone opts in, could we actually do it? What is your response to that? Yeah, so Laura Thomas and I disagree about lots and lots of things. So one of the things that we agree about is that San Francisco ought to finally, decades later, be making good on our treatment on demand commitments. We said back in the 90s we wanted to be a treatment on demand city. We said in the 2000s by voter by initiative that we wanted to be a treatment on demand city. And we do provide a lot of treatment to folks, but we're still not providing treatment to all the folks who are seeking it. And last year, there was a disturbing period where people who were seeking detox were getting turned away from our um, one of our primary providers, about half the folks during that period. So that is a big problem. All of that being said, um, and so, you know, I, I think we need to all be committed to expanding those resources, to supporting not just the folks on the front end to come in and get the treatment, but also the support over time, the step-down facilities for people who are coming out of a 90-day treatment uh, facility, and the ongoing support to, to support people in, in their sobriety. Now, um, I am also a supporter of Proposition F because I be my um, my concern about whether we will in fact be able to step up and provide treatment to this new population doesn't mean I don't think we should try. And the consequence of our failure to do that would be that people would simply continue to receive the cash payment they are receiving now. It would be the status quo. We have, and one th I think folks see all the money that the city has spent on homelessness and don't recognize the success that has been achieved, which is moving tens of thousands of folks off of the streets and into permanent supportive housing. We have literally moved, you know, t as I said, tens of thousands of folks. There's 12,000 folks tonight going to sleep in a permanent supportive housing unit paid for by you all. Now, and, and I think that's a worthwhile use of your dollars. The trouble with permanent supportive housing is that the supports are generally entirely at the option of the people who are in those units. And for folks who are not interested in those supports, we have very little leverage to get folks to accept treatment, to engage in care. Now, some people do. But um, I think it is, this is an idea that percolated up out of the uh, Human Services Agency, um, which oversees our, our county general assistance program. Um, folks in, perm that is a minority of the folks who are in permanent supportive housing, but they think that given the opportunity, they may be able to develop additional treatment programs beyond what Department of Public Health is doing, and that they can engage the population that is in, their, in buildings they're overseeing. And I, you know, given the crisis that we have, I say, why not, why not give them a try and let, them see, let us see if it works? And, and Holly Carver asks us to be clear on who's supporting which part. So no on F, yes on F. Um, Laura, no. yeah, you're gonna be, Laura Thomas, you have an interesting um, background because one, you've, you've done a lot of work on harm reduction at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Also, you're on the Entertainment Commission of San Francisco, so uh, you do that as well. Um, but you've spent a career thinking about these kind of issues. Um, why are, are you uh, uh, no on F? Well, um, first of all, I mean, I want to, I, I think Supervisor Mandelman and I, and I actually agree on a great number of things, and in particular, uh, you know, I appreciate his continued laser focus and persistence in trying to get us towards treatment on demand. I think we sometimes disagree on the solutions, but we generally agree very strongly on the problems. And, um, uh, you know, so I have a public health background. I work for the Department of Public Health here in San Francisco. Public health evidence is very important to me. And as Supervisor Melgar said, you know, the, um, I feel like the crisis that we have right now on our streets with drug use and in particular with overdose fatalities is so severe a crisis it, and so serious and it deserves serious, effective, thoughtful, immediate responses. And we do not have time to try things that have been proven to not work over and over again when we could be doing the things that we, that the evidence 
suggests will work. So, you know, why would we? And what would what would yeah. be a replacement? If, if this, if the evidence suggests this doesn't work, what would be something that does work to get more people, for instance, in, into treatment who need it? Yeah. So the the first thing, going back to what Supervisor Mandelman said, is having sufficient. Uh, effective, quality, welcoming, accessible, affordable treatment for everyone who wants it when they want it. And we can do a lot. It is very, it is shockingly difficult to get into treatment now in San Francisco. Um, and we need to make that as easy as possible. And we have really not been able to do that. So some of the programs that we provide at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, we're a licensed substance use disorder treatment provider. And I am very proud of our lowest threshold programs where people can walk in. They don't even need to give their name. They can sit down. They can meet with people in a group. They can talk to a counselor. And then as they start to want to engage more, we can step up the level of intensity of services, move people into residential treatment if that's what they want, um, you know, link them to methadone or buprenorphine if that's what they need, and and we move you know hundreds and hundreds of people into treatment that way every year. But you know, one of the things that we do is we incentivize treatment. We provide a type of of treatment called contingency management that is. A, particularly effective for stimulant use, like methamphetamine use, where we don't have medications like methadone or buprenorphine for it. And it provides people with incentives to be in treatment, to stay in treatment, to keep coming back. Um, and those have been shown to be very effective. We can do more of those types of treatment, of the low threshold welcoming services. We can provide more medications for opioid use disorder, which is particularly important in this moment of fentanyl. Um, we can provide more contingency management. But the, the challenge with just saying you have to go into treatment or we're taking away your resources, you know, you're, you're missing all of the opportunities to help people get into treatment. Like, the Human Services Agency could do, among the things they could do, they could do what we do. We have um, medication-assisted treatment linkage coordinators on our staff. So when someone comes in, our syringe access program, our harm reduction program, our Stonewall program, any of our well, programs. Well, what about, uh, I, yeah. I'm interested, Supervisor Melgar or, or, or Mandelman, um, what about this notion of that, you know, we have, we're just not doing enough to get into treatment. I mean, it's, it's a broader discussion that, that you know, some portion of probably people in this room, and there's a few questions here saying that we've gone so far on the sort of harm reduction front that we aren't doing enough to just like help people get into treatment. Do you agree or disagree with that? So I will just say that I, I agree with that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, human beings are complicated and they have all kinds of desires and walks of life. There is not one model that works for everyone. I think it's appropriate for us to have, you know, harm reduction, that to have, you know, sobriety. I mean, I, I think that we need to do more and we need to do more of everything that we know works. And we know that there's lots of stuff that works. These two people are very smart um, and very passionate. Um, in looking at Prop F, I actually have a much more practical. You don't hear that a lot at Board of Supervisors meetings saying well, that. Well, you know that. You're nice. We, and, okay. We like okay, each other. Yeah. But, you know, I have a much more practical reason why I don't like this. And that's, you know, that people need to eat once a day, at least, right? We need to eat once a day. And I think if you take people's resources away, we have a, a pretty bad uh property crime crisis in our city, I think, right now. Uh, and people go into Walgreens, it's all locked up. And I think that I fear that if we take people's resources away and they need to eat once a day, where they're going to go seek those resources is on our small businesses and our commercial corridors. And I think it's not worth it, given that we have no evidence that this will work. Well, um, Supervisor Mandelman, do, do you agree with that, that this notion that it could increase crime or homelessness or other issues because when someone's a drug addict they're not really making rational choices about oh it's better for me to go into treatment because i can get these city services they might just opt out do you think that has merit or I, no i don't know i but but i think i mean people um say uh, throw around phrases like evidence-based 
um, say that things are unproven. Uh, lots of things are unproven, and there is actually disagreement about, around among people who are far smarter than I am about drugs, um, about whether some me measure of coercion can be effective in getting folks into treatment. And um, there are very smart people, including Keith Humphreys, who was uh, President Obama's drug czar, who thinks that coercion can play a role. Um, I think that we have, I mean, I do believe this needs to be an everything in the kitchen sink approach. I, um, I am concerned, for example, about, um, a, a, about safe consumption sites because I think we can see empirically that there are cities where there seems to, where there, there has been broad acceptance of safe consumption sites and very high overdose rates. I don't know that there is a necessary connection or causation in that correlation, and so I support trying a safe consumption site in San Francisco. I think we can try many different approaches, see what works here. I think you can argue for or against almost any intervention. And I, and I think the jury is out, honestly, on lots of them. I think one thing we sh can agree on is that we, we, and we do obviously agree, that we should be making it much easier to be getting people into treatment. The, the European cities that have addressed their open drug scenes effectively have done it through a combination of treatment and repression. And you give folks the exit, you give them the way to, um, to be doing something different, you continually try to support that, and then to varying degrees, whether it is Portugal or Zurich or other places, there is an element either of a criminal justice response or even just panels having a conversation with you about why are you continuing to use and could you please stop? And I think that um, you do need to have something pushing on the other on the other side. I think the example the the conversation about contingency management is very interesting to me because it is bizarre that a little bit of positive reinforcement could counteract the impacts of this incredibly powerful and destructive drug methamphetamine. And yet for some reason, it works. Because we our brains are powerful we, things. We, we give you these <laughs> and little our wiring. gift cards and you use less meth. Nothing else works. You want to use meth all the time, but somehow this little gift card. Now I worry, and one of my concerns about, harm about some of the harm reduction interventions is that it could be contingency management in reverse, where you receive a level of support and, um, and comfort and community in ongoing use that is actually pretty destructive. Do I know this? No. Do I have concerns about it? Is it worth something I think we should explore as part of the the panoply of things that we ought to be looking at in San Francisco? I think so. Well, I, I want to bring the conversation. We spent a lot of time on F. I want to briefly kind of bring it back to, to A and C a little bit, just in this context, which is that, you know, a lot of, you know, folks who are unhoused may, you know, it's, it's, you, you can imagine what that must be like. And drugs are a way to cope with that kind of situation. How should we, to what extent are these problems actually related and housing do we need to like make that a priority because how can some you know how are we going to impact our whole community unless we can get unhoused people into housing how do these things actually relate together okay so you know housing is not one thing it's not one product right there's an entire spectrum from the single room occupancy hotel room to very high-end luxury housing but it is related you know because in a housing shortage those people who can afford more will bump down you know places that they would not necessarily uh, want but it's what's available so uh, you know we need more housing I will just state that. I think that you know we need more housing across the board, high income housing, low income housing. Um, and for the folks who are at the very bottom of the barrel, those are the folks who fall through the cracks the most. So I've been in San Francisco for a long time. And I remember when there was a lot of single room occupancy hotels on Mission Street, in South of Market, in Chinatown. A lot of those have disappeared. You know, and uh, folks that used to stay and be able to pay by the day, by the week, now really have no place to go. And we're seeing that on our streets. And so it is related, not, you know, one for one <laughs> replacement, but it is a spectrum that people sort of bump into each other because we have such an acute housing shortage. And so this uh, Proposition A is a drop in the bucket, but it's one that we need desperately. So we have committed to the state that we're going to do 
82,000 units of new housing over the next 10 years. Um, roughly half of it needs to be affordable. That's about 40,000 units. Some of it is already in the pipeline. We've already approved lots of it, but we don't have the funding. So uh, this won't increase taxes. It goes towards the housing that we need most acutely, low-income housing, low-income rental housing. We even have a little pot in there of 30 million for housing for women exiting domestic violence uh, situations, which is a very acute need. Those are the folks who end up you know homeless with kids um, and so uh, it's a good thing almost everyone supports it except the crankiest among us um, but it is something that we desperately need okay well and, and do you have a quick comment on just how housing factors in to yeah. sort of all of these kind of issues we face as an as an, in like our urban core yeah I mean California has created the homelessness crisis that we experience in lots of different ways and closing the mental institutions in the 50s 60s and until today was a big part of it um, there are other contributing factors the rise of fentanyl and meth which you know was discussed in the prior on the prior panel but um, I think it is undeniable that there is a connection between the high rate of homelessness that California has and the fact that California has among the most unaffordable housing in the country and the fact that there are fewer housing units per person in California than I think in all but one or two other states. So we have an acute shortage and we are going through an exercise as a state in trying to dial back and pull, uh, pull, pull back some of the regulations that have made it harder for the market to produce housing and we will see how that works over the next decades. But in the meantime, there are um, clerks and students and uh, c city employees and uh, and single moms and nonprofit and employees. nonprofit <laughs> employees and um, and people and disabled folks who cannot work and elderly people folks who simply are not going to be able to wait around for the market solution for the filtering effect that we may experience in 20 or 30 or 40 years if everything we're doing right now in rezoning and process um, changes works. So that's why we need to invest now in housing that will be open, we hope, in the next few years, that will be su subsidized and affordable at particular income levels for folks who are not going to be able to get it on the market. And $300 million, to be honest, does not get you a whole lot of that housing. 1,500 but units. 1,500 units is is the estimate. We'll try to we'll try to stretch it. We'll go out and try to find every last federal and state source to pair with that with those funds. Um, we need to do a ton more. But if without this money, um, there's very little path to to much affordable housing production in San Francisco at all. And, and I just want to end on one. Um, no, I just, uh, I just want to say something no. about the connection between housing and substance use disorder, yeah. which is that the the uh, you know the recent Benioff UCSF survey homelessness survey big survey of like I think three thousand plus enormous, people across California exactly yeah. found that a very small m minority lost their housing because of their substance use, but a large number of them were using substances. Substance use goes up after one loses their housing. Um, and people are using drugs and using fentanyl as part, as a, as a subsequent factor to losing their housing and not the other way around. And so it is, the housing is necessary for the housing. The housing is also necessary to prevent um, more substance use and to help people stabilize to get into treatment. So the two are absolutely closely linked and we won't be able to fully address the drug crisis and the overdose crisis unless we're able to achieve some let of these me just, housing Let me goals. just get to the fi final kind of question here, which I want you to weigh on, um, from one more, one more um, uh, audience member, from a, a kind of a paraphrase of, of Marvin Norman. But he's saying, he was talking about the police staffing, but it's a broader question which I hear a lot, which is, don't we have a 14.6 billion dollar budget? Can't we just afford everything? Why do we feel like we can't afford things? Where does all of that money go? Um, because all the things here require money, and we're a rich city. Is that that's what that's what Marvin says? Do we want to want to answer Why this one? Why does that Noe Valley bathroom cost 1.7 million dollars? Uh, I mean, it is unquestionably the case that um, that government is more expensive in San Francisco than it should be. We have a broken procurement process. We have broken hiring processes. We have a ton of stuff that we need to fix. 
we also have a ton of needs and they aren't cheap and we have been we have seen the federal government not take care of many of the things that they were taking care of in the middle of the last century. Housing for very poor people was primarily a responsibility of the federal government. Um, and the federal government largely went out of that business. Up until 2011, the state of California was one of the m major funders of, of housing for middle and low income people through redevelopment. Jerry Brown got rid of redevelopment and we lost one of the most important funding sources for housing that there is. So $15 billion gulp is a lot of money and honestly it is probably uh you know it may not be enough to meet all of the social needs that we that we have we need i think that we need this 300 million dollar bond um and we also need to spend the other money more effectively so supervisor mandelman and i are both on the budget committee so we're, we're going to geek out here a little bit um so I will just say that uh, what's different about this bond is that we have now put affordable housing in our capital plan. So we're treating it like infrastructure, like you know the roads and you know the sewer, um, which is a good thing, I think. You know, and it's a, it's an important decision that we made because it's an acknowledgement that we're always going to need to uh, have. Uh, housing for the workforce that otherwise would have to commute and cross that bridge and live places cheaper. Uh, we're also, besides an affordable uh, housing crisis, we have a climate crisis. We want to make sure that you know we rely less on gasoline and cars, and so this gets us there too. But to the 14.6 billion dollar budget, you know that also includes a lot of the businesses that we have in San Francisco. Like we're a rich city because we have these like business lines that actually make money for us, like the airport, like the port, like the PUC that sells electricity quite, quite and water. Actually. Right, right. It's what you know why we're able to afford such a nice place. Um, so despite that, we do have lots of need. You know, we have folks who have uh, a lot of uh, issues uh, and are not able to afford uh, what the standard of living that we have here in San Francisco. So, you know, it is more complicated than just say we can take this 14 billion and put it somewhere else because it's it's not quite that simple. The other point that always just needs to get made about bonds in San Francisco, or at least has needed to be made about bonds for about the last 10 or 15 years, is we have made a deal, or we prior elected officials actually have made a deal, which we are keeping, which is that we are not going to raise the amount of bonds on your property tax. And so new bonds are only issued as old bonds are retired. So this $300 million that's going to go for affordable housing, those bonds don't add on to your property tax bill. They replace prior bonds that have been retired. So I do think for, you know, for, for, for the budget conscious among us, um, that is maybe some comfort that that affordable housing money is not going to be increasing your tax. Well, and it's a good segue to the panel we're about to do on government accountability. We're going to talk about it in the context of the school bo board, perhaps. Can we give our panel a big round of applause? And if you can, stay after. We're going to do a reception about 20, 30 minutes. You can talk to, some, talk to some folks who have questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank okay. You. Good to see you. A quick background on Proposition D. And specifically, Proposition D is on ethics rules. And it says, Shall the city amend its ethic laws to further restrict the gifts city employees and officers may accept, expand the definition of conduct by city employees, officers, and others that those laws prohibit as bribery, require additional reporting of gifts to city departments, create a uniform set of rules for non-work activities of city employees and officers instead of rules by each department, create additional penalties for some ethics violations, require ethics training for additional city employees, and change the requirements for making future amendments to some ethics laws. And supporters say that the Ethics Commission, who sponsored this, has been working on this for three years, that residents deserve a city that is for the public good, not personal interests, and that reformed conflicts of interest laws and training will help ensure fairness. Opponents say that the proposition does not really actually tighten city ethics laws, that ethics laws are set by departments, and this is meant to be universal laws that might miss department nuance, and still requires voter approval to amend most city ethic laws. Um, also, Proposition D, we have the sponsor here, uh, Supervisor Engarda here today, and I'll read from this. Shall it be city policy to encourage the San Francisco Unified School District to offer Algebra I to students by their eighth grade year and to support the school district's development of its math curriculum? And specifically, supporters say that San Francisco eighth graders haven't been allowed to take algebra in the past decade, and it doesn't make sense, that it holds back kids who love math, 
and that it officially encourages schools to develop math curriculum and signals that math is valued. Opponents say that this isn't actually a law and it doesn't really have any teeth, that the measure does not substantially do anything um, substantial because most are in agreement in bringing back algebra anyway. So with that, we have Supervisor Joel Engardia, the sponsor of, of Proposition G, and also Alex Wong from SF Parents. He's a board member of that, and you've had um, a long uh, career in government affairs as well. And so, Supervisor Engardia, um, you've put this on the ballot, Proposition G, to specifically, even though it's not a law, you wanted to highlight something for the school board. The theme of our panel is government accountability. Why do you think that this is necessary to try to ensure government accountability uh, by the school board and the school district? Well, I think the residents and the parents especially and the voters of San Francisco have seen how the school board has gone off the rails in recent years. And as you mentioned, algebra was banned in middle school 10 years ago. Now, it was well intended. The idea was if some kids weren't ready for algebra, uh, then maybe we should just have everyone wait until ninth grade. But that never panned out. Uh, the kids who weren't ready, were they were not given uh, the ability to be ready, and the kids who were ready, uh, either they checked out or they left public school. The parents either took them out to private school or the kids just got bored and, and, and lost uh, interest. And so that's not good. Uh, and Stanford University did a study uh, that showed that this was a failed policy, and we've known that for about six years. And the school district and the school board didn't fix it. And when we recalled a number of school board members back in 2022, algebra was one of the reasons. And so um, what Proposition G is doing is saying that the people of San Francisco really want algebra in middle school like the vast majority of every school district in the Bay Area. And it's putting pressure on the school district to do it and do its job and fulfill its promise to actually bring back algebra. And so it's important to give parents a voice it's important that uh, the voters uh, show that there's a mandate for algebra because in November, a uh, majority of the school board seats are up for re-election or up for election. And so it's important to, to point to this um, March 5th uh, ballot measure to show if 80% or 90%, which I hope the voters say we, sh we should have algebra in eighth grade, it allows anyone running for school board to see that data point and know that the will of the people is to have algebra. And I'll say one thing, the, uh, a number of opponents will say, well, the school board just uh, a couple weeks ago voted to bring back algebra. But they did that because Prop G is on the ballot. You know, we've been working to put this on the ballot since last fall, um, and it puts a lot of political pressure and they were speeding up their process to bring back algebra, and that's a good step forward. But what they've proposed is not ideal. It says that only a third of the students will actually get algebra. The others will have to wait another three academic years. Uh, it's saying kids will have to take it in summer school or online courses uh, in the meantime, and that's not what parents want. The rest of the Bay Area has algebra now. And so parents really want algebra now. And, and I just want to say also, why does this matter to every San Franciscan? Maybe you don't have kids. Maybe your kids aren't in eighth grade. Maybe they're grown. It matters because for a thriving, functioning city, we must have thriving, functioning public schools. Because if we don't, the parents will leave San Francisco. There's a number of reasons why families leave the city. It could be public safety, it could be housing, uh, and it's definitely schools. And if you're not offering something as basic as algebra in middle school, you're gonna pull your kids out of public school. And we see it. We have one of the highest percentages of children in private school than any city in America. And just to, to give an example, uh, across the state, to average about nine to 10% of students are in private schools in cities. But in San Francisco, it's almost a third. So we have a tale of two different school systems in our city. And that's not good. I mean, th there's nothing wrong with private schools, but we need to m bring parents back to the public school and let the public schools thrive. And, and offering algebra is one of the reasons. And the l very last point I want to make on that is parents who do stick with public schools, they have workarounds. Well, the first workaround, if you can afford it, is just go to private school. If you can't af afford that 
and you do have some resources, parents will spend thousands of dollars to give summer school programs to their kids so they can uh, catch up and, and then get to calculus by, by senior year. But imagine if your family does not have the resources to go to private school or pay for those private classes and your kid loves math, you're stuck. So well, 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 this is all about if kids love math, we need to encourage it. Well, and, and, and Alex, so I want to get to you. I mean, you, you're a parent. You're on a, a, a group of, of sort of kind of activist parents that are, are, are trying to make reform changes. Um, why is it that, I mean, we have here in the Bay Area some of the greatest universities in the world in terms of higher education, yet we have, a, it seems like, a public education system that falls far short. Like, what is just your perspective and parents you talk to on, on, on that, and have we just sort of accepted that you know, our public schools aren't that great, and that's just the way it is. Well, that's the. Well, that's just the way. Uh, that's sort of like the the reputation of our public schools, and unfortunately, it's sort of like calcified as a result in this city. But if you kind of like dig deep, you can kind of see that there's a lot of successes here in our school district. Uh, if you talk to a lot of uh, uh, elementary school parents, especially, a lot of them are very happy with uh, their elementary schools. Our, one of the top high schools in the country is Lowell. It's here in San Francisco. It kind of shows to me that we have the, that this city and this school district has the capability to be able to serve and provide a really high quality education to every child that, that needs it. Uh, but we just need to be able to focus on it. It, th th it takes a lot of time and attention to be able to, to dedicate to have those types of like high outcomes. So that's like something that you have to constantly battle against though, as a result. That like kind of like what Joel is saying, it's hard to fight against the reputation of most of our schools when a lot of people don't experience it first time, don't experience it firsthand, aren't invested in it. Like Joel was saying, you know, San Francisco has the highest private school enrollment of any major city. San Francisco also has the lowest number of children of any major city. So the amount of people who have direct experience with our public schools is a very, is a very small number just to start off with. Well, and Supervisor Engardio, um, uh, I, I write a column every week for the, the San Francisco Examiner. I wrote one on corruption and the root causes of corruption. And, and, and honestly, I've never gotten so many responses. Like, I, I think I got, I mean, I got dozens and dozens of people who were like fired up by that column and like, we've got to solve that. Um, in terms of government accountability and this sense of corruption or losing confidence in, 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 in our government, do, do you think that affects solutions across the board, across all of our panels today? You know, uh, public safety, um, supportive services and housing. Or are people just getting worked up? Uh, or, or why is that such a, a hot button issue, this corruption and, 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 and sort of people being concerned about that? Well, corruption is real. We have department heads in jail, you know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, recently. So it's, it's a it's a real problem, you know, and there's systemic issues, too. If, if the top is corrupt, who did they hire and who's in the bureaucracy? You know, so so that that is a, a, a real issue. Um, but we uh, have a fantastic controller um, who is just retiring but has done great work to root out problems and corruption. We have a new controller coming in who's just as good. So um, I am hopeful that um, we are doing everything we can to uncover the corruption and correct uh, the past mistakes that we've made. Um, uh, it's wonderful that we have Carmen Chu as our city administrator. She's fantastic. Like I trust her, and she's going to do a great job. And she whipped the assessor's office into shape, and has done amazing work um, already. So, so there is hope on the horizon when it comes to corruption. Um, if you want to talk real briefly about Proposition D, I don't really see many people opposed to it. It kind of gets into the weeds about gifts and things that me as an elected official or department heads can take. Um, there's a binder about this thick that talks about all the different things you can and cannot do. And as, as a newly elected, as, as the newest member of the Board of Supervisors, I tend to err on the side of caution. I just don't take any gift at all. So, so what, are, what are the things that people wouldn't expect is on that list? Like if we're gonna, I don't know, meet up and, and, and or actually at our reception, 
by there and, and someone wants to buy you a drink, can you, can you accept that drink? Can you not accept it? What are, I, what are, how does I this generally, work? like there's all these things. Well, if it's $25 and under, and if it doesn't add up to this amount uh, over the course of a year, it's too complicated. I'd rather just pay, pay how, my how own How expensive way. are the drinks at Commonwealth Club World <laughs> Affairs? Does it, are, you, are you allowed to have, I don't know. But it's okay. just simpler. So you're s simpler because of all of these reporting requirements. Now, now D does more related to that. I, I guess it raises the question of, you know, we can add more and more requirements or reporting, but do we just have too many places for corruption to hide in the government? Meaning if there's a lot of regulations, a lot of rules, if we're really slow at issuing permits and licenses, it gives someone an opportunity to charge to expedite, per expedite permits and licenses. So is the solution just more rules or is it like making things streamlined so corruption doesn't have a place to hide? No, streamlining is the way to go. Like this expediter, like it, if you want a permit to build something in San Francisco, it's it's such a labyrinth. It's so bureaucratic. You hire a guy who knows a guy, and he expedites you through the process. And that's where all the and we have one of the most famous expediters in San Francisco history is now in jail. Just recently was sent to jail. So, definitely we need to. If you're as a regular person who wants to remodel your kitchen you should be able to just go and fill out the form and get it done right like we we gotta get out of the way I, when it comes to bureaucracy i say we need to uh we need to um, cut the red tape and roll out the red carpet if you're an entrepreneur you want to do something or you want to actually change something in san francisco because we want to allow entrepreneurs to have a real good runway um to to try to make their good idea fly um I, I, before we run out of time, though, I want to just go back to algebra for a second to make <laughs> okay. make a really important point. <laughs> is that I, I wish I need a slide. This is five <laughs> x plus you know I mean, the right. algebra problem. But no, okay, make make your but, point. Yes, but eighth grade algebra is not the end all be all. It's very important, very important. But it but we also need to focus on the deficiencies in math kindergarten through seventh grade, so people all kids can be ready for algebra in the eighth grade. And that's why I love Alex's group, SF Parents. They have done a lot of work and research into how to fix all the stuff moving like between K and seven. So um, so it's a package deal, but algebra is important, is important to all of us because we want to keep families in San Francisco. The more families who leave, the worse it is for our city. And having something as basic as algebra will keep families here. And, and Alex, I, I want to give you the last word in terms of um, Supervisor Engardio alluded to the fact that it's like, you know, parents getting involved. Um, we are a community group, we, that is all about like a community-led movement. What is your opinion, because you've worked in government affairs, you've worked in the offices of elected leaders, you're part of a parents group of just like, how much do we wait on what electeds, like Supervisor and Guardio do, and how much is it like the community, us taking action to make things happen in your experience? Uh, well, I have to say it's kind of more of the latter. That's kind of like how SF Parent Coalition and SF Parent Action grew out. It grew out of the, the, the during the COVID, when schools were closed and you know our schools were, were closed far much far too long, and it took that type of community activism to be able to push the school district to be able to you know galvanize the community to be able to make that type of change. Um, so that's like uh, what you kind of have to do. And I guess just to touch on what uh, Joel is saying, there is incredible value in knowing what like the voters want. What is it that people want? Um, like just for example, uh, just by a show of hands, who who has ever given public comment at the board of supervisors? All right, and how many people have also given public comment at the uh, Board of Education? Even less than that. So Prop G is, the f is pretty much like the first time that anyone has ever been able to like say, this is how I feel about this issue. And this has been an ongoing debate that's been going on for like 10 years. And 10 years ago, that's what it was like when, uh, you know, people were even like, more, you know, this issue was even more in the, uh, more salient then. And then, the fa then even to see that happen over parental objections, like that's that's like a that's a, that's even a lack of accountability right there. And now that it's finally happening, and so that's why it's we're able to you know there's like fundamental value in being able to make it so that we can all this is what we want, and that if you continue to not do that, now you're going against what the voters want, and then that then that's like other ways of accountability, whether it's like school board elections or uh, you know, further down the line, like people who are like, who's the superintendent and you know, who's in power. You kind of need to know that and kind of see, put people on the record in order to recognize that. Well, and, and I think what you're maybe alluded to also is that if the people speak with one voice and it's very, very clear, then 
a lot of elected officials, others, it's pretty tough to st if the wave's coming to stand in the wave. You're probably going to surf the wave and go with the wave as well. And 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 um, and, and, and certainly it'll be interesting to see you know what happens with the, with the school system. Yeah, here. if I, I could just yeah. double back that, you know, school re re school reopening right now seems like a no brainer. But if you think if you sort of dial back to like end of 2020, beginning of 2021, it, it was not a, like a, a slam dunk. People were like, how dare you get like my child, you risk like my children getting COVID. How dare you risk like our teachers like getting COVID. And before, and it wasn't until there was like uh, the school board members were potentially being recalled that they decided to be like, okay, oh man, we really need to do this right now. And then that's how you saw it motivated people into action. And even more so, uh, because you know, school board recall, school board recall has never happened before. Like in what is it, Joel? Like hundred plus years. Hundred years. Hundred years. So you don't know how it really works out. You don't really know how people believe. And it isn't until the school board recall, recall was successful with like seventy percent of the vote, you realize, okay, I don't, I'm not alone here. I'm not crazy. So I'm, that's why you know, this is what it means to have like a community voice. Okay, there you go. I'm not crazy. There are other people <laughs> out like it. Um, we, I want to get to the most exciting part of this, um, which is a chance to meet a lot of candidates who are here, have great discussions, ask your individual questions. So first of all, can we give our panel a round of applause? Can you guys hang out a little bit and, and, and answer questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor. Okay.